Hello, and welcome to St. Columba Cathedral, the central church of the Diocese of Youngstown. I'm Sister Joyce Candidi, a member of the Oblate Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Director for the Office of Religious for the Diocese of Youngstown. This week, the church throughout the world begins the Sacred Triduum, the three days celebrating the great mystery of our salvation in the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ the Lord. Another significant celebration marking Holy Week is this morning's Chrism Mass. Chrism comes from the Greek word, literally meaning an anointing, also called myrrh, or holy anointing oil, or consecrated oil. At this Mass, oils are blessed and consecrated to be used in the sacramental life of the Church in this coming year of grace. In the Mass of Chrism, which we are about to begin, the entire diocesan church gathers around the bishop to renew their identity as a priestly, prophetic, and kingly people signed with the chrism of salvation. Ordained priests renew their commitment, and all are reminded of their baptismal call to holiness, service, and faithful witness to Christ. As the early church gathered in the upper room to celebrate the new Passover, the gift of Holy Eucharist, and service to God's people, so do we gather in this cathedral today to celebrate that same love and service. The Mass of Chrism is a hinge, securing and opening the door to the sacred Easter mysteries that we are about to celebrate this week. As is traditional, the Chrism Mass is a sign of unity, and each parish throughout the diocese will have official representatives in attendance. Each parish is also represented by a banner which adorns the cathedral during this ceremony. Most of the banners are distinguished with not only the name and place of each parish in the Diocese of Youngstown, but also a distinctive color which identifies the county in which that parish is located. For example, parishes in Ashtabula County are to have the color red on their banner's background. Background colors for the other five counties are Columbiana yellow, Mahoning green, Portage, orange, Stark, blue, and Trumbull, purple. The Mass of Chrism comes once a year in our cathedral and cathedrals throughout the Catholic world. During the Chrism Mass, the bishop blesses the oil of catechumens and the oil of the sick, and he consecrates the oil of Chrism. We use the first for adult catechumens and infants, the second for the anointing of the sick, and the sacred oil of chrism for baptism, confirmation, the ordination of priests and bishops, and the consecration of altars. All three oils are basically olive oil. Additionally, chrism spices the air with a scent of perfume, traditionally balsam. Bishops have blessed oil ever since the early church. They baptized catechumens at the Easter vigil and prepared chrism fresh for the occasion. While they were blessing chrism, they blessed the other oils as well. Rather than overburdening the vigil with this ritual, bishops blessed these oils at the previous celebration of the Eucharist, Holy Thursday. This also allowed time to transport vessels of oil from the cathedral to all the churches in the diocese. For more than 1,000 years, bishops blessed the oils at the cathedral's Holy Thursday liturgy. But in 1955, the Church added a separate Mass earlier in the day at the Cathedral for that purpose, the Chrism Mass. Today, it may be celebrated on a different day, shortly before Holy Thursday, to give the celebration independence and so that more people can attend. This is what we started in the year of 2013 in the Diocese of Youngstown by celebrating the Chrism Mass on Tuesday of Holy Week. Since the bishop is the only minister in the diocese who may consecrate Chrism, this Mass highlights his ministry and our union with him. He will not baptize and confirm everyone in every parish in his diocese but he will be symbolically present in the chrism which the priests and deacons will use in the sacraments. 
In recent years, this Mass has also acknowledged the ministry of priests. It invites them to renew their commitment of service and to receive the prayers and support of the people. The Mass of Chrism gathers the faithful of the diocese at their mother church with their shepherd to prepare for the celebrations of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection in all our churches throughout the year. As I mentioned earlier, chrism comes from the Greek word literally meaning an anointing, also called myrrh or holy anointing oil or consecrated oil. Chrism is essential for the Catholic sacrament of confirmation and is prominently used in the sacraments of baptism and holy orders. The chrism consecrated by the bishop is used to anoint the newly baptized, to confirm, and to anoint the hands of the presbyters and the heads of the bishops at their ordinations. Those to be confirmed after receiving the laying on of hands are anointed on the head by the bishop or priest. In baptism, if the person baptized is not to be immediately confirmed, the minister anoints them with chrism. Newly ordained priests are anointed with chrism on the palms of their hands, and newly ordained bishops receive an anointing of chrism on their foreheads. Chrism is also used in the consecration of objects, such as churches and altars. In former times, chrism was used to consecrate patens and chalices as well. The sign of the cross would be made with the chrism in the interior parts of the paten and chalice where the Eucharist would rest. The sign of the cross would then be smeared to cover the entire interior parts. The chalice and paten would need to be consecrated with chrism again if they were regilded. This ritual could only be performed by a bishop or priest with the faculties to do so. However, this is no longer the practice and currently a simple blessing by a priest suffices. Chrism is made of olive oil and is scented with a sweet perfume, usually balsam. Under normal circumstances, Chrism is consecrated by the bishop of the particular church in the presence of the presbyterium or ordained priests at the Mass of Chrism, which traditionally took place on the morning of Holy Thursday. The oil of catechumens and the oil of the sick were also blessed at this Mass. Catechumens are prepared and disposed for baptism with the oil of catechumens and the sick are anointed in their illness with the oil of the sick. These holy oils are usually stored in a special vessel known as an oil stock. There is also a type of oil stock that is shaped like a ring to make the anointing easier. The jewel of the ring is a container with a removable lid. Chrism is a sign by baptism and confirmation Christians are plunged into the paschal mystery of Christ. They die with him and rise with him. They are sharers in his royal and prophetic priesthood. The Chrism Mass is rich in symbolism and meaning. The local church is united on this occasion in its ministry of service to catechumens, the newly baptized and the sick. In particular, the Chrism Mass is one of the principal expressions of the fullness of the bishop's priesthood. The concelebration with priests from around the diocese signifies their close unity with him as his co-workers in the ministry of Holy Chrism. The rite and texts of the Chrism Mass also give attention to the priesthood through the renewal of commitment to priestly service. The entire assembly is asked to support and pray for the priests and bishops in their service to God and to God's people. The bishop possesses the fullness of the ordained priesthood. He is the focus of unity within the church and within his diocese, and he ministers together with his priests and people. He is the high priest of this local church and of the Diocese of Youngstown. Jesus Christ is the Anointed One, and all whom he calls to follow him are anointed with chrism at their baptism and at confirmation. Those called to serve as priests 
and bishops are also anointed with chrism at their ordination. At the chrism mass, the priestly people gather with their bishop to celebrate the gift of chrism with which we are all initiated into the people of God. The church is called to a ministry of healing in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. During the chrism mass, the oil of the sick used in this sacrament is blessed. The blessing of the oil of catechumens reminds the local church of its ministry to those preparing for the Easter sacraments at the Easter vigil. Each year, in these sacred mysteries, the church is renewed through the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, the source of the church's life and holiness. Bishop George Mary will preside over this Mass of Chrism. Concelebrating priests in the sanctuary include the deans of the six counties of the diocese, including Father Raymond Thomas of Ashtabula County, Father Robert Edwards of Columbiana County, Father Gregory Fedor of Mahoning County North, Father Terence Hazel, Mahoning County South, Father Richard Pantello of Portage County, Father Lawrence Friend of Stark County East, Monsignor James Clark of Stark County West, and Father Frank Zanni of Trumbull County, and the College of Consultors, including Father Bernard Bono, Monsignor Michael Criglio, Monsignor William Connell, Father John Jarek, Father Thomas McCarthy, Father Richard Murphy, Monsignor Robert Sifrin, and Monsignor John Zora along with other priests from the Diocese of Youngstown. The deacons for today's Chrism Mass include Reverend Daniel Finnerty, a transitional deacon from Holy Family Church in Poland, who will be ordained to the priesthood this coming June, and Reverend Mr. Robert Green, a permanent deacon from Blessed Sacrament Church in Warren. Servers for the Chrism Mass are the seminarians studying for the Diocese of Youngstown. They are Dean Carson, Jr., Zachary Coulter, Matthew Humrichhaus, Scott Kopp, Simon Mino, and Matthew Zwilling. The St. Columba Cathedral Choir, under the direction of organist and choir master, Dr. Daniel Leguinia, will provide the music for the Mass. Cantor will be William Ambert. The solemn Mass of Chrism is about to begin. It is truly a festival of color, sights, and sounds, 
ritual actions, sacred words, and a priestly and kingly people united in Jesus Christ, from whom comes forth the new life of grace and the sacred time and holy place. CTNY would like to thank you for joining us for this Mass of Chrism, and we invite you to join us in the prayerful and Holy Spirit in which it begins.
and of the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God who anointed your only begotten Son with the Holy Spirit and made him Christ the Lord, graciously grant that being made sharers in his consecration, we may, we, we may bear witness to your redemption in the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. We now begin the Liturgy of the Word. In sacred scripture, the living Word of God is proclaimed to bring glad tidings to God's people. The first reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah will be read by Brian Partika from Holy Rosary Church in Lowellville. 
A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord, and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. You yourselves shall be named priests of the Lord. Ministers of our God shall you be called. I will give them their recompense faithfully. A lasting covenant I will make with them. Their descendants shall be renowned among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them as a race the Lord has blessed. The word of the Lord. In response to the reading, Psalm 89 will be sung by Cantor William Ambert. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. have selected my servant David and anointed him with my holy oil, my holy oil, my holy oil, my hand will be constantly with him. He will be able to rely on my arm. Forever I will sing the goodness of faithfulness and love. His fortunes shall rise in my name. He will invoke me, my Father, my God, and
second reading from the book of Revelation will be read by Katie Schrader from St. Stephen Church in Niles. A reading from the book of Revelation. Grace to you and peace from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. To him who loves us, who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming amid the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will lament him. Yes. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. The book of the Gospels is carried in procession all stand and sing the gospel acclamation. The gospel from St. Luke will be proclaimed by Reverend Daniel Finnerty from Holy Family Church in Poland. The Most Reverend George Mary, Bishop of Youngstown, will give the homily. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had grown up, and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind and let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord.
Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler, long I stood. And looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. In 1916, the American poet Robert Frost published what was to become one of the most famous poems in the world, The Road Not Taken. Since its publication, literary critics have rushed to say that although the poem is well known, it is frequently misunderstood, and it is often turned into, as one critic wrote, a piece of hallmark happy graduation sun sees the future poofery. According to Frost, the point he wanted to make was not that when we come to a fork in the road, we should study the footprints and take the road less traveled. Or even, as Yogi Berra quipped, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Now what Frost meant was that in order to make life meaningful and worthwhile, we must choose one road, we must choose how we are going to live. Frost is not the only one who believes in the power of choice. Sociologist Alan Ehrenhardt writes that many people go through life like the person who sits in front of the TV constantly tapping the remote control, what he calls that ultimate weapon of personal choice, proceeding in the course of an hour to select and reject dozens of visual entertainments whose ability to satisfy us for more than a few minutes is crippled by our suspicion that there may be something more stimulating a couple of frequencies further on. To many of these things in our lives, small and large, have come to resemble channel surfing, marked by a numbing and seemingly endless progression from one option to another, all without the benefit of a chart, logical or moral. This is the world in which we live, a world of a multiplicity of choices. But even in this cultural context, Jesus, who is yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Jesus is unmistakable in his choice. We just heard it articulated in this morning's gospel. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. His choice is to announce the kingdom of God, to bring to fulfillment the hopes of the poor, the imprisoned, and the oppressed. He is the one anointed by the Father to begin a completely new era. It is no accident that this passage is used year after year for this chrism mass. Here we bless and consecrate the oil that is used in the sacraments that make of us a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart so that we may announce his praises and announce to those in darkness that they have been called 
into his wonderful light. The meaning then of this chrism mass could not be clearer. As those called to continue the mission of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God rests upon us, consecrates us, and bids us to go forth to proclaim his peace, his joy. But to make that spirit real in our lives and in the lives of others, we must choose, we must choose the road of discipleship. The choice begins with God's gift, the experiences we have had of authentic love, of forgiveness without strings, of mercy beyond that for which we have dared to hope. We are called to share that, share what we have been given with those who have never heard of it. The choice continues in two movements. First, following or coming after the Lord, which requires us to establish a personal relationship with him. That personal relationship is much more than attending Mass on Sunday or saying an occasional prayer. Being in relationship with the Lord demands spending time with him, personal time with him in prayer, opening ourselves to him and allowing him to lead us where he knows we will be our best. The second movement is being sent, sent by him to proclaim the good news. Our entire history as a community of faith has been structured around a series of calls from God to go forth. This is the ancient and eternal cry of God to his friends. Go forth, he said to Abraham. Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk to a land that I will show you. Go forth to Pharaoh, he said to Moses. Go forth to Babylon. God said to Isaiah, go to my people Israel. God said to Moses, go where the spirit leads you. God said to Ezekiel. The Lord says the same thing to us today. Go forth, put down the remote control, choose a road and proclaim the good news. That is what Pope Francis means by the word evangelization. In Evangelii Gallium, he writes, evangelizing presupposes a desire in the church to come out of itself. The church is called to come out of herself and to go to the peripheries, not only geographically, but also the existential peripheries, the mystery of sin, of pain, of injustice, of ignorance and indifference to religion of intellectual currents, and of all misery. To evangelize in imitation and adoration of Jesus Christ, we must choose to bring glad tidings to the poor, that they may know that their lives are precious in the eyes of God. We must choose to proclaim liberty to captives, so that those who are paralyzed by fear and doubt and despair may feel their shackles dissolved. We must tell those blinded by ignorance and anger that they have the grace to see God within and without. And we must speak the truth so that all who are oppressed by prejudice, isolation, poverty, violence, abuse, and racism may know that they are indeed the children of God, beloved, and blessed, and are held dear not only by our Father in heaven, but also by all of us here in Northeastern Ohio in concrete, recognizable, and tangible ways. This is the road of discipleship, to live like Christ. St. Clara of Assisi, a woman who knew a lot about choices said it well. What you hold, may you always hold. What you do, may you always do and never abandon. 
but with swift pace, light step, and unsurvering feet, so that even your steps stir up no dust. Go forth securely, joyfully, and swiftly on the path of prudent happiness. Believe nothing, agree with nothing, which would dissuade you from this resolution, or which would place a stumbling block for you on the way, so that you may offer your vows to the Most High in the pursuit of that perfection to which the Spirit of the Lord has called you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. We have nothing to fear. Choose this day to live like Christ. At this time, Bishop Mary invites the ordained priests to renew publicly their priestly promises and commitment to ministry in the Church. And now I invite my brother priests to renew their vows to serve all of you and to be faithful to the Lord. I would ask my brother priests to please stand. Beloved sons, on the anniversary of that day when Christ our Lord conferred his priesthood on his apostles and on us, are you resolved to renew in the presence of your bishop and God's holy people, the promises you once made. Are you resolved to be more united with the Lord Jesus Christ and more closely conformed to him, denying yourselves and confirming those promises about sacred duties toward Christ's church, which prompted by love of him, you willingly and joyfully pledged on the day of your priestly ordination. Are you resolved to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God in the Holy Eucharist and the other liturgical rites, and to discharge faithfully the sacred office of teaching, following Christ the head and shepherd, not seeking any gain, but moved only by zeal for souls? As for you, dearest sons and daughters, I invite you now to pray for your priests that the Lord may pour out his gifts abundantly upon them and keep them faithful as ministers of Christ the High Priest, so that they may lead you to him who is the source of salvation. Pray also for me, that I may be faithful to the apostolic office entrusted to me in my lowliness, and that in your midst, I may be made day by day a living and more perfect image of Christ, the priest, the good shepherd, the teacher, and the servant of all. Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. May the Lord keep us all in his charity and lead all of us, shepherds and flock, to eternal life. Amen. And now I would ask my brother deacons to stand. Brothers and sisters, please join me in thanking these men for their dedication to the church. I noticed that some of you were looking at the deacons. I meant the deacons and the priests, everybody. <laughs> please be seated.
The liturgy of the Eucharist now begins. The gifts of bread and wine and the oils to be blessed and consecrated in this Mass of Chrism are presented by members of the congregation. The bishop first blesses the oil of the sick. Presenting the oil of the sick is Nancy Hatch from St. William Church in Champion and Barbara Sembach from Immaculate Conception in Rome. The bishop will then bless the oil of catechumens used in the sacrament of baptism and which is the first anointing that one receives in the Catholic sacramental life. Presenting the oil of catechumens are Sheila Roncone and Mia Roncone, both elect and catechumens from St. Joseph Church in Jefferson. Finally, the bishop consecrates the chrism, which is, as the word consecrate suggests, holds preeminence among the sacramental oils of the church from which this celebration receives its name. The word chrism in Greek means an anointing and refers to that special gift, Jesus Christ himself, whose presence is extended throughout the world through the sacramental life of the church. The bishop pours the perfume into the oil and mixes the chrism in silence. He then breathes over the opening of the chrism vessel and with hands extended says the prayer of consecration. Presenting the holy chrism is Kevin Arroyo, a confirmation candidate from St. Angela Marici Church in Youngstown, and Patrick Fleischer, also a confirmation candidate from Immaculate Heart of Mary Church in Austin Town. Following the blessing of oils and consecration of chrism, the altar will be prepared to receive the gifts of bread and wine that will become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. God of all consolation, you chose and sent your Son to heal the world. Graciously listen to our prayer of faith. Send the power of your Holy Spirit, the Counselor, into this precious oil, this soothing ointment, into this rich gift, this fruit of the earth. Bless this oil and sanctify it for our use. Make this oil a remedy for all who are anointed with it. Heal them in body, in soul, and in spirit, and deliver them in every affliction. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Lord God, protector of all who believe in you, 
Bless this oil and give wisdom and strength to all who are anointed with it in preparation for baptism. Bring them to a deeper understanding of the gospel. Help them to accept the challenge of Christian living and lead them to the joy of new birth in the family of your church. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray that God, our Almighty Father, will bless this oil so that all who are anointed with it may be inwardly transformed and come to share in eternal salvation. God, our Maker, source of all growth in holiness, Accept the joyful thanks and praise we offer in the name of your church. In the beginning at your command, the earth produced fruit-bearing trees. From the fruit of the olive tree, you have provided us with oil for holy chrism. The prophet David sang of the life and joy that the oil would bring us in the sacraments of your love. After the avenging flood, The dove returned to Noah with an olive branch, announcing your gift of peace. This was a sign of a greater gift to come. Now the waters of baptism wash away the sins of men and women, and by the anointing with olive oil, make us radiant with your joy. At your command, Aaron was washed with water, and your servant Moses, his brother, anointed him priest. This too foreshadowed greater things to come. After your son, Jesus, our Lord, asked John the Baptist for baptism in the waters of Jordan. He sent the Spirit upon him in the form of a dove. And by the witness of your own voice, you declared him to be your only well-beloved son. In this, you clearly fulfilled the prophecy of David that Christ would be anointed with the oil of gladness beyond his fellow men. And so, Father, we ask you to bless this oil, which you have created. Fill it with the power of your Holy Spirit through Christ your Son. It is from him that chrism takes its name. And with chrism, you have anointed for yourself priests and kings, prophets and martyrs. Make this chrism sign of life and salvation for those who are to be born again in the waters of baptism. Wash away the evil that they have inherited from sinful animals, and when they are anointed with this holy oil, make them temples of your glory, radiant with the goodness of life that has its source in you. Through this sign of chrism, grant them royal, priestly, and prophetic honor, and clothe them with incorruption. Let this be indeed the chrism of salvation for those who will be born again by water and the Holy Spirit. May they come to share eternal life in the glory of your kingdom through Christ our Lord.
preparation of the altar, the song, The Church of Christ, is being sung. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice as yours may be acceptable to God and Almighty God. May the May the power of this sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, mercifully wipe away what is old in us and increase in us grace and salvation and newness of life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Give it up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen.
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son high priest of the new and eternal covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, but with a brother's kindness, he also chooses men to become sharers in his sacred ministry through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word, and to strengthen them with the sacraments. As they give up their lives for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters, they strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as in exaltation we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith.
Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Columba, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and George, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you, in your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. of chrism precedes the Easter Triduum. The Paschal Triduum is the three-day season, counting from sunset to sunset, from Holy Thursday through Easter Sunday evening. During these days, Catholics keep one festival, our Paschal Feast and our Easter. We come together with all people of this diocese and in spirit with all Christians in every time and place to fast, to pray, and to keep watch. It is the Passover of the Lord. May our experience of the Paschal Mystery through the ritual actions of light, word, 
water, chrism, bread and wine truly become a celebration of who we are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Immediately following the Mass of Chrism, parish representatives will take sufficient amounts of the oils and chrism back to their respective parishes. The newly blessed oils of catechumens and consecrated chrism will be used at the Easter Vigil and throughout the coming year as new Catholics receive the sacraments of initiation. The oil of the sick will be taken back to parishes to be used in the healing and consoling sacrament of the anointing of the sick.
Let us pray. We beseech you, Almighty God, that those you renew by your sacraments may merit to become the pleasing fragrance of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. After this morning's Mass, the oils will be available in the Cathedral Hall. Also, through CTNY, the Chrism Mass will be rebroadcast in the coming days. A complete schedule can be found in your worship booklet. The Lord be with, with you. you. May the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in and out the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. This festival of Holy Chrism has been brought to you through CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown, and ETC Ecumenical Television Channel. It will be rebroadcast in its entirety on Wednesday, April 1st at 10 a.m. It will also broadcast in the Stark County area on Thursday, April 2nd at 10 p.m. and in Conneaut the week of April the 8th through the 13th at 12 noon. Please consult your local cable listings for the channel. I'm Sister Joyce Canditti, a member of the Oblate Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Director for the Office of Religious for the Diocese of Youngstown, thanking you for joining us for this Mass of Chrism from St. Columba Cathedral, the central church of the Diocese of Youngstown. On behalf of Bishop Murray and the people of the Diocese of Youngstown, we wish you the blessings and joy of the risen Lord during this Easter season. Let the splendor of holiness shine on the world from every person, place, and thing signed with this oil.
In 2014, the Church celebrated the 50th anniversary of Vatican II, the Council which brought new clarity and energy to our understanding of the Catholic faith. In the decree on the adaption and renewal of religious life, Perfecte Caritatis, Vatican II addressed religious orders, encouraging them to revisit their roots and use that insight to adapt to the modern world. Pope Francis, in honor of the 50th anniversary of Vatican II, has planned a year celebrating religious and consecrated life. The year of consecrated life has three objectives. The first objective calls religious and all in the church to make a grateful remembrance of the recent past. Building on this positive outlook on the past, the second objective is to embrace the future with hope. And the third objective is to live the present with passion. He has issued a letter from the Congregation for Institutes and Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life entitled Rejoice. This letter reflects much of what Pope Francis has been teaching regarding religious life. During this time, Catholics are called to acknowledge men and women religious in their local communities and consider the contributions they've made in our country and in our world. It is a time to bring prayers, gratitude, awareness, and education to the entire church about consecrated life and its various forms so that it may be promoted among God's people. Men and women religious take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. These vows free them from the ties to earthly possessions and power structures so that they may more closely follow God. They are public vows, just as men and women take public vows when they join in marriage. This is different from diocesan clergy, however, who take promises instead of vows. Religious men and women's role in the church not only allows them to work within the diocesan church, but also transcend boundaries and reach out to undeserved groups of people around the world. Religious life has and continues to be an integral part of the church, withstanding times of turmoil, renewal, and reform, and adapting to changes in church history and in the world. It is modeled after the experiences of Jesus' apostles, who left their previous ways of life to follow Jesus and proclaim his message. Religious orders are responsible for continuing Jesus' prophetic mission by virtue of their lifestyle, which seeks to remind all that here we have no lasting city. Rather, we are pilgrims on a journey to our Heavenly Father. This involves interpreting God's covenant for a current time and place in history. The first group of women religious came to the present-day United States in 1727. This group of Ursuline sisters from Boulogne-sur-Mer, France, established a community in the southern United States near present-day New Orleans. Members of other communities arrived as well and the population of women religious grew to 500 by the year 1830. By the turn of the 20th century, that number grew to over 50,000. After World War II, the population of women religious peaked at 180,000, with the population of religious brothers reaching over 12,000. By the year 2013, the numbers dropped to a little over 50,000 religious sisters and over 4,400 religious brothers in the United States. Throughout our country's early history, religious communities sought to serve the poor by seeking to bring God's good news of love for them, particularly by offering health services and education and advocating for justice. During the early 1800s, when Catholic immigrants faced discrimination, women religious reached out to the marginalized. They addressed their needs and encouraged them to remain committed to their faith during these difficult times. Many daughters of immigrant families entered religious life. At this point in history, the way of life among religious communities became more institutional in order to accommodate their growing numbers, 
and their need for education and training. The Diocese of Youngstown was established during this time to serve the growing Catholic population in the area. There were 150,000 Catholic people in the diocese when it was established in 1943. Several religious congregations were already present in the newly formed diocese. The Humility of Mary Sisters, formed locally in 1864 in neighboring Villa Maria, Pennsylvania, the Ursuline Sisters of Youngstown, its local foundation formed in 1874, began with a group of six sisters from Cleveland who came to serve in St. Columbus School. The third group, already present in the diocese, were the Precious Blood Priests, Brothers and Sisters, who served in the Canton area. The diocese also invited religious groups to serve the needs of the people, including the Society of St. Paul, the Daughters of St. Paul, and the Oblate Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Each religious community upholds a charism, which underlies a community's mission. It comes from the Greek word charis, meaning gift. St. Paul used the word to refer to a gift of the Holy Spirit offered for the common good, benefiting both the giver and the receiver. Charism is a unique way that a founder of a religious community responded to the Holy Spirit and invited others to join in their vision for the good of the church. For example, Father James Abarioni, founder of the Society of St. Paul, believed in the importance of communication. St. Angela Marici, founder of the Ursuline Order, encouraged her company of women to respond to the needs of the times and to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. The grace of a charism, like the Holy Scriptures, is not a static entity. God's Word is universal, speaking to people across time and space. It is constantly evolving in response to the needs of God's people. Likewise, religious life continues adapting to the needs of our contemporary world, embodying Christ's love. Historically, religious communities provided new members with education, and members of the community entered the same field. Today, new members bring educational and field experience, along with creating a greater diversity in ministry. Men and women religious serve a variety of roles, including teachers, social workers, campus ministers, hospital and prison chaplains, and counselors. Initially, there was concern that this diversity would splinter the community, but the trend towards diversity has proven the opposite. It encourages mutual support, all the while strengthening local religious communities. Different communities have also collaborated with each other on projects, drawing on their diverse talents and resources. In 2007, a group of lay and religious women came together to form the Collaborative Initiative to End Human Trafficking. The group educates healthcare professionals, social service workers, and the general public about human trafficking, and also helps victims access the care and services that they need. Another example of collaborative work is the Dorothy Day House in Youngstown. The Ursuline Sisters and the Humility of Mary Sisters founded Dorothy Day House in 2009, carrying out the vision of journalist, activist, and servant of God, Dorothy Day, to serve the poor and work towards social justice. As we celebrate this year of religious and consecrated life, remember the religious men and women who have touched your lives over the years. Continue to pray for the men and women religious who have given the gift of self in service of God's people. There are also many opportunities to get involved with local communities of men and women religious. If you feel called to join a religious community, speak with a vocations director. Other opportunities to get involved include associate programs. Associates are lay people or non-vowed men and women who desire to become more deeply involved in the mission of that particular religious community. 
associates minister with the community and also expand the charism and vision of the community in their own daily lives. After 50 years of Vatican II, Pope Francis invites members of Consecrated Life to recognize this important moment for evangelizing their vocation and for bearing witness to the beauty of following Christ unreservedly. The Pope exhorts religious to continue to take up the witness that has been left them by their respective founders and foundresses so as to awaken the world with their prophetic witness, particularly with their presence at the existential margins of poverty and thought. Let us all, religious, clergy, and lay, welcome the encouragement that the Pope offers us to see ourselves and the world with the eyes of Christ and to remain concerned about it. said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. We know him as Dismas, Saint, the good thief. He was one of the criminals who was crucified next to Jesus on Golgotha, the hill of the skull. He was able to have hope in the midst of his certain death. Do you ever wonder if St. Dismas ever knew Christ as he walked on the earth? Maybe he once heard him preach on the hillsides in the Galilee. Or maybe he saw Jesus heal a leper or raise the daughter of Jairus back to life. In any case, Dismas was touched deeply by the love and forgiveness of Jesus as he hung on the cross, speaking words of forgiveness and love in spite of overwhelming odds of hate and despair. Although St. Dismas came to faith only when he was faith with his own death, Jesus responded in love to his request with the words, Today you will be with me in paradise. How often in our own lives do we think that it is too late to change or too late to ask forgiveness and reconciliation? It is never too late to seek forgiveness and reconciliation in Jesus' name. The door to paradise is always open for us. All we have to do is accept the love and forgiveness of Jesus himself and enter the gates to everlasting life. Jesus invites us daily to take up our cross, to walk in his ways, and to join him one day in paradise. <laughs> 